Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Aaron Hajar. Aaron joined Bergen Newbridge Medical Center in July 2017 and currently serves as the Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President for Strategy and Innovation. Mr. Hajar provides executive leadership for hospital operations, strategic planning, managed care, and community health. Prior to joining Bergen New Bridge, Mr. Hajart served as the Assistant Dean for Clinical Strategy and Development at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Mr. Hajart completed his bachelor's degree in athletic training from Hardin Simmons University and went on to receive his master's degree in human relations and business at Amherden University. He maintains his board certification in athletic training and is a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. Aaron, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's amazing having you on. Um, you know, you've had such a diverse background and career. Um, you actually started your career in athletic training, like was mentioned in the bio, but uh, what wasn't mentioned in there is you were actually working with professional baseball teams, hockey teams, football, volleyball teams. I even think you interned uh, for a little while in the NFL, uh, which is awesome. And now you're leading healthcare strategy and innovation at Bergen Newbridge Medical Center in New Jersey. So first question that I have, how did an athletically focused Texan native end up in New Jersey uh, as a COO and, and senior vice president for strategy and innovation at a hospital? Yeah, I, I get that a lot. And I, I usually start with, oh, I, I drove here type of a thing. Uh, <laughs> I did. I drove a U-Haul here. It was crazy. Uh, awesome. But uh, yeah, it was an opportunity. I, I worked as an athletic trainer for a while and, you know, riding buses in the Midwest and the Northeast and uh, as a 23 year old, 24 year old, 25 year old, it's amazing, you know, who doesn't want to go work in professional sports and, you know, be out till one o'clock in the morning and, you know, wake up at 11 o'clock and hit the, you know, go to the stadium, you know, that was great when you're 23 and 24. Um, and, and then, you know, 26 hits you and you're like, wow, this is not, you know, my knees hurt and I'm getting old and I'm only 26. So, uh, you know, I, I, I had some great mentors who got me kind of into uh, more of a healthcare, direct healthcare provider role and, and working in initially physician practices. And it was actually my team doctor who was like, hey, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think you'd be good in this, you know, are you interested? And I'm like, yeah, I'm tired of riding buses to Nashville, New Hampshire. So uh, it was an easy decision, even though I had no idea what I'm doing. And, and then just kind of over time, I went from being very comfortable being in the dugout or being on the sideline to being very comfortable being in a suit and, you know, being in a, a board meeting talking about, you know, where our focus is for, you know, 2022. So um, it's, you know, a lot of the skills I learned from my athletic training days uh, and kind of refined, I, you know, still use every day. It just is a, a different, different, slightly different way. I, I really love that. I think it reminds me, Aaron, how, you know, as humans, we, I think we're really bad at predicting the future for ourselves. So, you know, is it fair to say that when you first started your career, you didn't imagine that, you know, decades later, you'd be the CEO of a hospital? I'm guessing that wasn't the plan originally. Is that pretty far different than what you were planning originally? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you told me at 22 when I was graduating college, uh, my undergrad, that I was going to be working in the hospital as CEO, I'd, I'd be like, no, not, not what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to go work at the NFL. I knew I wanted to do, I had a career focus. And, and then I got an internship opportunity you mentioned, and, and uh, I hated every minute of it every minute of it. I'm like, this wow. is not what I want to do. And so I had to like pivot a little bit, but, you know, I, and even later, you know, in, a few years later, and, and quite frankly, even 10 years ago, uh, I, I never envisioned being where I am today in the role. And, and you know, I, all the things I got to do over time got me here, but, um, you know, it made me appreciate um, because of how hard everything else was before. It me makes me appreciate where I am and, you know, what I get to do today. That what about awesome. the part where you uh, you got into strategy? I think for a lot of people, um, strategy is it's kind of a buzzword. Um, so now that you've been doing this for at least some time now, like from an executive perspective at a hospital, like how do you define strategy when you get asked about like what exactly do you do? Yeah, I mean, it's it, strategy is all about creativity, uh, and I, I have uh, I'm my daughter. I have a beautiful, you know, she's gonna be twelve year old daughter. She's amazing. She's the most artistic person uh, I know. She can paint. She can draw. I don't have an artistic bone in my body, which is funny because I have a twin brother who is uh, amazingly artistic mm -hmm. and uh, is, is, was in advertising for a long time, is creative, um, and has since got out of that. But, uh, you know, I was never really, uh, a, you know, artsy kind of guy, but, you know, I was always very creative. And, and I think that's where I've 
uh, kind of been able to um, you know leverage that kind of skill in in you know in the strategic realm because obviously strategy isn't isn't about or operations it's not implementing something um, it's not you know improving something it's literally you know coming up with an alignment a relationship or any connectivity between two disparate things that makes sense and you know builds whether it be capacity or volume or, or relationships over time and and so I think you know the number one thing that you have to be the skill you have to have to be successful in a strategic role is to be a very creative thinker. It's not critical thinking. Hmm. Critical thinking is very different. It's all about creativity. Hmm. Uh, Aaron, throughout your career, you've maintained this we first attitude over the kind of selfish I attitude, um, often prioritizing teams and organizational wins over personal gain. Um, you've also talked in the past about the importance of teamwork and accountability and I think in some ways, it's easier to see that on a 10 or 20 person sports team compared to the hundreds or thousands of employees that you lead at the hospital. And so my question is, how do you build and maintain a we first culture in a large hospital organization? Uh, I'd love to say it's easy, but of course it's not. Uh, I think the first thing you have to do is, you know, you really have to be a leader by example. And, uh, and that's very hard to do. Uh, I've had a conversation recently about that. You know, it, it's not something that you just find intuitively because, you know, particularly when you get to an operations role, you're going to be leading departments that you don't really know all that much about in the grand scheme of things. Um, so, you know, but you still need to be a leader by example. So I won't ask somebody to do something that I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the height of COVID, uh, you know, I was out at our mobile testing site, collecting samples and, and labeling samples. You know, we set up a, a lab and we're doing a thousand drive up tests a day, uh, antigen tests, because that's what our community needed. I was in the lab and literally running tests. Um, you know, so my, I, I, you know, it's not what I want to do. It's not what I envision doing, but it's something I think you have to do to be a good leader is to lead by example and, and be willing to do what you ask others to do. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, you got to really make really rational decisions and it can be in a very irrational time. Um, but, you know, I think first and foremost, you have to recognize that, you know, you're asking people to do something that takes them away from something else. There's always, you know, you, you know there's so, so much pressure on people's time. And so the one thing that, you know, I think is important is focusing on culture that understands people's personal pressures. And, you know, if they need to work from home, they work from home. If they, you know, I, I had a, a, a text to one of my directors um, last night because at, at 6.05, she's still sending emails and doing work. I'm like, go home. You have a family. This is, your family is much more important than this email you're going to send out. So, you know, you really have to, you know, prioritize, you know, their personal time and your own personal time. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is, um, you know, you got to spend plenty of time out there and seeing what's going on and being on the units. Um, you have to, you know, have a meaningful interaction when you're there. It's not just uh, walking around to the unit and waving at people. You know, you have to ask questions. You have to figure out what's going on. You have to solve problems. I mean, you know, I, I ran the other day and, and um, actually I shadowed somebody. I shadowed one of my staff, one of my recreation therapists. And I'm, I'm you know, literally sitting behind her, watching her over her shoulder, driving her nuts, I'm sure. And she was doing something very oddly. She was like, she didn't have access to a particular software. I'm like, well, why would you go on your cell phone to your email to do this and that? And she's like, well, I don't have access. And, uh, you know, you have to be able to solve problems. And like right there, I'm, you know, on the phone with our IT people trying to figure out, you know, how do we give her, and not only her, it was all of the rec therapists uh, didn't have access to a particular program. So, you know, getting them the access they need to be successful. So you need to, it needs to be purposeful, but it also needs to, you know, produce results. I really love that. I mean, yeah. it, it, I think the first point you made about, you know, not asking your team to do something that, that you wouldn't do, it reminds me of, I mean, here in our organization, one of the things I, I kind of believe in is, you know, no one is too good to pick up the trash, like both literally and figuratively, like no one can be, we all have to pick up the trash. Sometimes I have to pick up the trash. Alan does too. So that really resonated. Um, you know, one of the things, Aaron, that, uh, you know, we've really appreciated, you know, learning about your perspective on, on innovation has been your, your emphasis on data. So, you know, we were reading how, like, back when you were at Rutgers, you published a study on the financial impacts of leveraging athletic trainers as physician extenders. And you found there, you know, to be a, a cost benefit from increasing patient throughput. Um, we we're curious, like, today, um, you know, what are the most exciting ways that you're using data at your hospital to deliver uh, better care? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the pandemic has has helped us think, you know, um, you know, everyone's thinking about big data. Well, you know, you have all this information, but then how do you use it? And so we spent a lot of time looking at positivity rates and by zip code and figuring out, you know, where we're going to deploy um, our public health initiatives. We do um, pop-up testing where we go to different towns and, and you know, go there because that's where the hotspot is. We go to different areas that are underserved and have, you know, low um, vaccination rates to focus on, you know, pop-up vaccine sites. And so I think, you know, we have all this great information that we never really know how to use. Uh, and, and then we, you know, we just kind of let it sit there. So, um, you know, what we try to do is um, instead of using um, predictive analytics, uh, which, you know, um, I think is important, um, you know, we try to use reflective analytics where we reflect on the information we have, we look at trends over time, and we make, you know, um, deployment or, you know, uh, or operational decisions based on where we see trends going. So for instance, uh, I just had this conversation a little bit ago in our uh, behavioral access department, we noticed that the trends in behavioral health access, getting in to see a provider, you know, behavioral health provider, didn't follow the trends of medical. Uh, so in medical, you know, summer is dead, it's, you know, not a lot of patient volume. In the um, fall, it starts to pick up a lot. Uh, into the winter, except for over Christmas, where it dies down, but in the winter, it can steadily grows. Uh, and then picks up even more in the spring, and then it dies out at the end of spring into summer. Uh, and in behavioral health, that's really not the case. Um, we found that in so certain programs, for instance, our substance use program, the volume picks up quite a bit over the summer. Uh, and, and, you know, that, you know, we, we ask why, why would that be the exact opposite of, of, you know, most of our medical care? Um, and you think about it, you know, a lot of people with substance use problems um, can leave their house and can get access to more things that are going to be um, detrimental to their health care. Um, and they're going to need those resources and services, uh, you know, when, you know, when they need them, which is going to be when they can access them, which is the spring and summer. Um, and same thing with behavioral health, you know, behavioral health, um, you know, you're shut in a lot in the winter. And so you actually, we actually see our behavioral health volume decline in the winter, particularly, um, you know, uh, during periods of bad weather. Um, whereas, you know, medical, you know, isn't, isn't as um, dependent on, on weather temperature uh, as a, a volume driver. So I think it's important just to have the information there, but then be able to use it. And so what's important for us is take this big, big scope of data, um, minimize it to something that can be digested and interpreted and then implemented or deployed uh, as part of your implement implementation strategy. Really makes sense. Yeah, I was going to say reflective analytics. I think that's a, a term you're going to have to trademark, Aaron. I don't think anyone's yeah. done that yet. I'm so a, I'll Google it in a second. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, Aaron, another study, since we're on the topic of you know digging up old studies that you've done, um, another study that you contributed to was one evaluating online patient education readability. And this particular one was for otolaryngology surgery. Um, but the main findings in that paper was that uh, the educational materials online are often written at a, a too difficult to read uh, a reading level for a significant portion of the population. So my question is, could you share why health literacy is so important and why uh, in the industry it's often overlooked? Yeah, I mean, I can start with why it's overlooked. It's very easy, and that is the... Um the providers and the staff who are delivering the care to patients and, you know, even, you know, front desk and, and other support staff, generally speaking, they're, you know, they have a, love, a higher level of educational attainment than those who you're treating. And so it's hard for somebody, you know, with a master's degree or doctor degree to sit there and understand that, you know, somebody may not comprehend things at the same level that they do, or even, you know, at a high school level. Uh, and so, you know, people don't recognize that, you know, you need to be, you know, um, you know, providing literature, you know, at or below a seventh grade level, um, you need to be able to communicate, you know, in ways that people can understand it. And I think, you know, we, because, you know, most of the people providing the service don't live that way, have, you know, and don't read at that level, they don't understand the difference that that is required to make something, you know, comprehensive and comprehensible uh, to a patient. So, I mean, definitely, I think that's the driver. You know, as far as importance goes, you know, we're so used to communicating verbally. Um, now, you know, the last 15, 20 years, we've, we've transitioned to being a very uh, electronic, you know, communication means. Uh, and, you know, I think 
particularly with the you know the underserved population and those who are who you know haven't gone to college you know they're using you know shorthand they're you know they're tweeting about stuff they're tweeting about things you know in characters that i you know don't understand i i see what my my daughter texts me i'm like what the heck are you talking about i mean come on like use words um but like you know we we, we everything that we do everything every peripheral you know pamphlet we give a patient every medical record we supply them you know is is not written at a seventh grade level and you know if we're giving them all this information that and they're we're holding them accountable for you know taking care of their own health care uh, but then we've given them no way to understand it and to digest it and then more importantly to explain it to their loved ones you know then we really you know are not we can't hold them accountable for that so you know, when I was at Rutgers, we did that study, and 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 actually, you know, the ENT department, uh, by led by a, a senior author in that article, Dr. Eloy Anderson, um, he really focused on on readability uh, yeah, for a number of years there, and and you know, the the sad part is we found out in in every instance just about that, you know, we're we're writing things at four and five and six and you know and eight sometimes grade levels above. Uh, what the reading level is for the patients that that's meant for. So I think, you know, I wish we would, we could do more and wish we did more. I mean, there's no way for a hospital to bill for health literacy. I mean, you're not going to make money doing it. Uh, and it's, you know, so where do you find the funds, you know, to, to focus on that? But, you know, it's something here that, you know, we, we're just now really, you know, starting to key into as part of our social determinants of health program. It's, you know, you can talk about trying to do better for the community but then you know if you can't communicate with them how are you going to do better so you know something that we're definitely looking, you know trying to, to integrate we uh, a couple of episodes ago we had dr dan chu on the podcast he's um a surgeon and uh, the vice chair of clinical research over at uh, uav in alabama and they have a big focus on, on health literacy as part of their research and, and clinical efforts and so they've done like a really good job focusing on reducing the reading level to i think about the grade four reading level for their patient education materials one of the questions we asked him was, well, what about the verbal instructions that the care team is still giving? Because there's still a lot of that. And, and how do you make sure that's also at, you know, let's say a grade four reading level? And he goes, yeah, that's really hard because, you know, you have residents and fellows and staff coming in and out all the time and, and other, you know, allied health providers being able to train everyone to teach at a grade four reading level. Like, I don't think anyone's done that yet. So this, to your point, there's still, I mean, even if we get the the paper or digital stuff, right? There's still a lot of opportunity to somehow get that, the verbal yeah. stuff, right? So that's a tough one, yeah. Luckily, that's not a question for me because I couldn't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Aaron, maybe a question that you can answer. Um, you know, today there is uh, an explosion of patient-facing innovations in digital health. So you brought up the, the fact that everything is moving and shifting towards more of this electronic communication. Um, digital health, things like patient engagement, um, like engaging patients digitally in their pre and post surgery care plans, monitoring symptoms, post op, that kind of stuff, um, all the way over to like chatbots to triage patients on the hospital websites. I'm curious, what patient facing digital innovations are you most excited about as a, a hospital innovation leader? Oh, uh, you said it, chatbots. I love chatbots. Uh, it's actually something me and my, my, my brother share a lot. And we, we had this whole conversation about chatbots about a year ago, actually, we were looking to deploy chatbots in, in, um, in, in our COVID community health testing department. And uh, I, I love chatbots. I think, you know, they offer a low cost, um, easily reproducible and, and significantly documentable service. And uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of work on the back end to make it work and get you the right information and, and make the, the questioning algorithms uh, make sense um, to lead you down the right path. But, you know, I think that is, um, you know, we've started to see the innovation there, but I think that's probably the next big thing uh, in healthcare is utilization of, uh, of chatbots. The second part of that is asynchronous uh, um, patient care in general uh, and having, you know, uh, we, we used to think, well, the only way we can interact with the patient is, you know, is having them in front of me. And then it went to, oh, we can do it via telemedicine as long as we have uh, a, uh, a video and video, uh, I'm sorry, video and, and, um, and voice recording. Uh, and then, you know, the pandemic hit and they're like, oh, we can't do this anymore. We need to pick up the phone, right? Which is, by the way, how we did it 
70 years ago. Uh, but the, the asynchronous, you know, through email or through chatbots or through um, screening algorithms, uh, you know, I think that is um, the next wave because it's cheap, it's easy. Um, it's an, um, though it's not probably gonna be reimbursed by health insurance, it's an inexpensive out-of-pocket cost. You know, if you say, you know, give me 10 bucks to have your health question and, and or uh, taken care of by a doctor and then get a prescription for whatever the cream is or whatever may is that you need. Um, it's as simple as filling, you know, form out, answering some questions, uploading, you know, pictures, you know, of you know, if you have a lesion on your skin or something, you know, that is truly you know, patient-centered, it's patient-focused, it's easy, it's inexpensive. And, you know, I think those are, you know, that's, you know, I think the next big wave innovation-wise in, you know, kind of digital health. But I think in a broader term, um, you know, which we're just starting our journey now, we hired a, a new medical director uh, for our digital health. Um, she started a few weeks ago, uh, Rebecca McAdams, and, and she's, you um, uh, she's focused on creating a, an ecosystem, which I know is kind of like, you know, that's a, the cool word everyone wants to use all of a sudden, but you know, really an ecosystem to look at how digital health touches every part of our organization. Yeah. And, you know, whether it be, you know, ambulatory, it's easy to think, well, I got primary care doctors. So, you know, I need, you know, digital health for telemedicine services. I, in behavioral health, I, you know, I can do telemedicine there, but, you know, we're looking deeper and, you know, looking at, you know, the traditional virtual urgent care. So, you know, through our emergency room physicians providing 24 7, 365 access to patients with immediate needs, um, you know, adding those resources to, uh, to our um, long term care division and, and uh, outsourcing that to other long term care facilities. Um, so, focusing on the post acute care um, aspect of it. Um, you know, even going to um, uh, at home laboratory testing, you know, right? and, and this is something we learned over the last couple of years. We started down our telemedicine journey in 2019, I think. And uh, what we found was that we were doing a lot of work, generating a lot of, of opportunity for the hospital, whether it be you know downstream radiology or downstream lab work or referrals to other physician services, but capturing very little of it because the patient was at home and that home may be 30 minutes away. Um, and and then we're asking them to go get a lab test done or go, go get, you know, uh, x-ray done. And, uh, and then we weren't, you know, taking advantage of that. And so we launched our at-home lab testing recently and, and are you know, leveraging our, our broader digital health strategy to, you know, really drive, you know, continued care and, and continuity of care along of our continuum through these, you know, at-home testing strategies, these other, you know, telehealth um, uh, programs, uh, and trying to keep them connected, you know, throughout their, their treatment plan, um, you know, with the hospital. I, I really love your comment about the asynchronous piece, Aaron. I, I think to your point, I guess we, we start off with everything has to be real time. And now we're realizing, you know what, there are other ways to stay connected with patients that are still convenient, still, you know, consumer patient centric and all that. You know, one of the things I always wonder about the long-term future, you can imagine, you know, at some point, maybe there are, you know, AI driven avatars that, can deal with natural language processing and it feels like you're talking to a clinician and, and maybe they can take over some of the more direct communication pieces. Is, is that a, is that a feature that, that you think might be scary or if it's, if it truly doesn't, you can't tell the difference if that's avatar is a clinician or an AI, maybe it doesn't matter to a patient. I don't know. I'm, I'd love to know if that's a scary feature in your mind or potentially an interesting one that could just deliver more care at scale. Listen, I saw iRobot, so that yeah. scares the heck out of me. I don't want a computer uh, replacing me, but uh, no, I think, you know, I think ultimately that's where we're going to go. I mean, it's going to be like Star Trek and you have, you know, your your you know, ship's doctor, I think his next generation, whatever, had a computer as uh, the doctor. Maybe it was, I don't know, one of them had a computer as a doctor, right? And I think that's where ultimately, you know, decades and decades from now, that's where we're going to go. Um, you know, I, I think we need to be open, not to that, but to to other forms of healthcare that is um, effective, pro provides high quality, is, as and provides that at, at a lower cost than what we do today. And that's why I really like, you know, asynchronous because it can be done at the convenience of the provider and the patient, and doesn't need immediate response and can fill in operational gaps or time gaps in a provider's schedule so that they 
can be more productive. Um, so I, I, I do think we're a, a ways away from, you know, the avatar aspect of it and having, um, I think the algorithms are pretty close, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, on the adoption side, you know, I definitely, you know, the, the, the um, you know, the look and feel of it isn't there. Um, you know, this is a max headroom. It's, you know, we have a long way to go to make, I think, the patient comfort there. Um, you know, how does, how do you have an avatar show emotion, right? I mean, we, we want our, our healthcare providers to understand what we're going through and, and emote with us when we're struggling with something. So um, I, I can't wait to see that. Um, I, I'm just going to happen and just, you know, I, I, it's, it's a long road to get to, to, you know, truly, you know, AI, you know, functional, uh, you know, kind of activity. Definitely a ways away. I agree with you there. By the way, I brought, I brought up iRobot and Star Trek in, in a conversation. So. <laughs> I love awesome. it. Yeah. Um, so Aaron, actually, I, I had a, a question. So um, when COVID first hit, New York and New Jersey were some of the very first areas in the United States to be affected. And that comes with a lot of pressure, right? What were some of the most important lessons that you learned during that time? Uh, well, the first is, you know, you have to pitch in in ways you never thought you'd have to. Uh, and never want to again. Uh, it wasn't a lot of fun. We were in the county I'm in was the hardest hit county, uh, hard, hardest hit part of the U.S. for for months, um, and still has a very, very, very high positivity rate. This last time around, you know, in, in December, January, we were hit all over again with Omicron, like you couldn't believe. Um, we were having, we were testing thousands of people a day some days 64% positivity rates. I mean, it was really crazy, um, you know, but, you know, you just have to learn to pitch in and kind of do what you need to do. Um, it's not fun, but it, it just kind of happens. Um, you know, I, I, what I didn't recognize before uh, was how Im impactful stress was um, in, you know, in caring for patients. I mean, you know, I've, I've been a direct care provider and yeah, I mean, jobs are stressful, but this was a whole different level of stress and, and it hit everybody. And, you know, I think we identified ways to help each other cope, but, you know, it, it definitely was eye-opening for me, um, both as seeing my coworkers and loved ones and, and friends, you know, dealing with this, but also then kind of dealing with it myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing was that we, um, we were pretty lucky I mean, we weren't lucky. It was terrible, but we had a lot of support from the community. People were, you know, donating food. We had the local EMS and first responders come in and do drive-bys and honking their horns and flashing their sirens. That happened two or three times, um, actually maybe four times. Um, you know, we had a lot of people reaching out and, and well wishes and everything. And that was great. You know, that was mm -hmm. April of 2020 through, you know, er, early to mid-summer. But at some point, you know, that went away. And we, um, we don't really have anything to fill that gap. And so you have all of these, the support that, you know, made people say, okay, one more day, I'll, I'll you know, I'll come back one more day. And, and then that goes away. And so how do you fill that gap? And I gotta tell you, um, I was surprised, uh, cause I don't, you know, I'm not a super emotional guy. I was surprised by how challenging that was for me. Uh, and, and so I can only assume that, you know, for, the rest of, of our team that it was equally or more, you know, unnerving. And so uh, I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my team. I learned a lot about my family. My family was amazing. You know, there'd be days I just came home, I couldn't talk. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and my wife and daughter completely got it. We're, and were amazing, you know, during the entire process. You know, Aaron, as, as terrible as COVID has been, I think for us, one of the, the silver linings is when we see, you know, all the folks in healthcare um, who've just been so resilient in the face of all of this, it's frankly, truly inspiring. Um, and, you know, the fact that people came together, keep, I mean, still today, keep pushing forward. It, 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 it's so meaningful to everyone else who is at the front line, who frankly will never fully understand like what you and your, your team go through. But I think we're also thankful and just like, I really admire, wow, like look what, you know, humanity can do when, they really have their backs against the wall and they can come together and do this. It, it's quite phenomenal. So, so thank you for everything that your team is doing in the community. It's, it's really, I mean, it's super easy to say, you know, 
America sucks and, you know, we're terrible people and we treat every horribly. And then, you know, this happens and sure, there's a couple people who are, you know, still jerks and there's a couple people who, you know, weren't part of the team, uh, but it was unbelievable. You know, I, uh, you know, being on the floors and being in the ED, um, particularly ED, um, being with our community health team, you know, during uh, the pandemic and being with them literally collecting samples, mm-hmm. I, I'm shocked by how resilient they were. I mean, how they came in and, and you know, had a smile on their face uh, every day. And I'm like, I, I don't know how they did it. I mean, I struggled doing it. And uh, I mean, I tell, you know, some of my staff all the time how much I respect and admire how they've handled um, handled it. I had, a, luckily, a very good friend at work um, who I, you know, I, I went through this entire experience together. And if it wasn't for her, you know, I, there's no way I would have, you know, been able to come into work every day with us. I didn't really always have a smile on my face, but not a complete frown. So, uh, you know, I think that's the great thing about teams, right? You have people who are there to pick you up when you're down. And, and I, we definitely saw a lot of that during the pandemic. Yeah, that's awesome. And Aaron, I think, you know, you come across as you're, you're very modest, um, but you've actually, you've received exceptional praise from your colleagues. Um, I actually spoke with Elizabeth Schachtel uh, recently, who you've worked with for a number of years. She's the, she was a physician extender uh, and is now the coordinator of community health and testing at Bergen. Um, so in order to prep for this conversation, I reached out to her and, and she was basically just saying so many amazing things about you and your mentorship that you've given her over the years. Um, And you mentioned mentorship in the beginning, and that's how you kind of pivoted into this role and into this new career for yourself. And so I was really curious, you know, why do you believe mentorship is so important and how has it helped you in your career? Well, I mean, first of all, and most importantly, best can get a raise. So uh, (laughs) I'll work on that as soon as this is over. Uh, You know, um, it's very nice of her. Uh, So, you know, I think... Um, you know, I, I always was very fortunate to have some people that kind of, you know, helped me out, talked me through my mistakes and, um, you know, maybe they didn't do it always the way I, you know, I liked, um, but they were honest and insightful. And, you know, I worked uh, with a, a, the doctor at Rutgers, Peter Carmel, who was like a neurosurgeon, Pease neurosurgeon, very well known. He was a president AMA for a year. And, you know, he always took time to listen and had good insight, always had a story, um, could always explain stuff, you know, and, and so always really, you know, looked up to how he dealt with, with things and people. Um, yeah. And what I found, find out about mentoring is that, you know, I had so many people, whether it was, you know, Peter, or, you know, I worked with this guy, Johnson Zoni, who was a primary care sports doc that really launched my career. I had, I had a, um, a guy who worked at Rutgers, uh, Justin Samble, who was a senior associate dean for clinical affairs, like people who really cared about you. And that really is, I think, the most important part of mentorship is that you really actually have to care for the people you're mentoring, and even if you don't really know them very well. Um, I'm very lucky to be able to say I'm mentoring probably 12 people right now. Uh, and I truly care about each one. I tell them every time, you know, I'm here for you. And, you know, even if it's, you know, one hour a month, I mean, this is your hour and we're going to talk about how do we get you to whatever the next level is that you want to get to, because I had people that were doing this. They may have known it. I mean, and I didn't know it then. I didn't think about this as mentoring, you know, 15 years ago, but those were the conversations and the opportunities they gave me. And so it's really my way of giving back because people took the time and did this, you know, for me, how, who I, would I be if I wouldn't take the time and do it for them. I think that makes so much sense. It's, I mean, I, I'm, I've been a big fan too, Aaron, of, uh, you know, just paying it forward in some way, because to your point, like, I think we've all stood on the shoulders of other people who've, I mean, I can count so many people who've gone out of their way to, to mentor and help me. And I don't think there's any way I could actually mentor or help them in any way, but they do it anyways. And all they say, is, you know what, Josh paid for it to someone else that you can help. And I, I really love that, that mentality. That, that's wonderful. Um, as you know, by now, Alan is a, a fantastic uh, hunter of information and, and backstories. And so he, uh, he found an old quote of yours, uh, highlighting career advice that you give to your 18 year old self. And you said, you know, don't get hyper-focused on your college degree, focus on the skills you acquire 
you most likely won't even work in the field your degree isn't for very long. Ah, very true for, for your story. Um, what, what would you say are, are the most important skills you've acquired as a healthcare leader? Uh, <clears throat> definitely like focusing on creative thinking instead of critical thinking. I mean, I think, you know, you can be a very good critical thinker, but that doesn't mean you're creative. And so just because you think yourself out of a box doesn't mean you're coming up with a very good solution. And, and so that's a skill that really I've, I thought I had, you know, I never really thought about it that way, but the more I've worked in healthcare, the more I realized that, you know, creativity is super important. And I think I, I mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, the other one is, is compassion. I, I, and this is something I really got from my daughter. I mean, like, when my daughter was born, I, uh, I wasn't necessarily the nicest guy in the world. And, you know, I know plenty of people would argue I'm still not the nicest guy in the world, but, um, you know, I, it changed my perception of the importance in, in life. And, you know, I went from say, well, it's your job, be at work, you know, to your family is important. Uh, your job second to that and deal with the family before you deal with work. And, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, I think we we get so focused. We, everyone's, during the great resignation, we're like, oh, people are quitting, you know, how dare they? And, you know, I go back and say, well, how dare us? I mean, we, we had plenty of time to try to transition things to remote working. And we had plenty of time to, you know, talk about to staff about putting family first and doing things to actually do it. And, you know, I, we just don't. And, it's, you know, it's we in a society, we don't like, you know, we're, you know, in Europe, they do, right? They take seven months off in the summer. Uh, you know, they they get paid double time in, you know, in the spring so that they can have money saved up for their summer vacation. And, um, you know, we don't do that here in the U.S. And, and you know, that's good and bad, I guess. I mean, it's just different. But I think it's important to try to have compassion and recognize that, you know, people have a lot going on and we need to, um, while we need them, you know, to do their job and be held accountable for the job, the job is their job and that, you know, they check out and they're going home and you're not calling them at eight o'clock at night with questions. And, you know, I struggle with that. I mean, in hospital COO, I get called all hours. You know, I try really hard to not call my staff after hours and on weekends. And um, if I do, I guarantee them, you know, then they better leave early the next Friday or they need to do this. I mean, I don't want to, to impart myself on their life any more than I would want them to impart themselves on my life. So, Aaron, I see a lot of people in your organization to be requesting to, to move into your department. Uh, sounds sounds like they, they, they'd have a great uh, mentor. Well, about to do that. I, I'm not that nice. <laughs> so, there's probably, probably, I would suspect that people that work in my departments uh, would probably agree with you, but I think, you know, I, I'm also, I have a pretty sharp edge and uh, I'm a, I'll tell you exactly what I think of an issue and, you know, we'll, um, you know, so, you know, I guess I have to be somewhat exude some compassion because I'm not necessarily um, the, the kindest person in the world, but, you know, I do think it's important uh, um, to stress to my, my staff and my direct reports and for them to express to their staff that, you know, we're, we're a family, but your family is your family and we need to focus on your family as well. So, so I love that. Um, just a, a, a more broad kind of uh, life advice, kind of business advice. What's the best advice you've gotten about uh, work, life, or being efficient? Uh, probably best life advice, uh, and I don't remember who said this to me the first time, but I've heard it a few times, and, and that is um, no one ever wished on their deathbed that they spent another hour at work, mm -hmm. you know, that they completed that one more assignment or that they finished that one more deal. And, uh, and I, the pandemic of all things is probably the one thing that kind of taught me that the most. I mean, I, even though I was working a lot more hours and working harder, I also spent a lot more time with uh, my family and in, in, in a meaningful way instead of just staring at a computer screen or you know mm -hmm. watching tv you know more meaningful um relationships with them and so um you know i i for me um i do want everybody to prioritize non-work life uh before they get to work because you know if you have too many things going on outside of of work um if your life is 
a mess and you know you're you're falling down outside of work you're gonna fall down inside of work too yeah that's great um to aaron just being mindful of your time we're gonna shift over to what we call the fast five lightning round um so this is basically five questions to get to know you better for our audience uh and first question that we have is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most uh the one i give away the most is called five days of memorial it's a book about uh a hospital uh, in uh, in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. Um, I don't, can't, can't think of the name of the author, but uh, I I give that to every you know healthcare leader that I I, I have a relationship with. It's a great read and really speaks to um, how decision making can really impact people. Yeah, that's great. Um, question two. This one specifically for you. If you could only watch or play one sport for the rest of your life, which one would it be? <laughs> um, I would love to answer this, uh, underwater BB stacking, but that's a game myself, my brother made up when we were kids. Uh, I would, I'd probably say if I had to watch a sport, I wouldn't play a sport anymore. I'm too old for that, but, uh, I love baseball and, uh, sitting in the stands of the baseball game in the summer mm -hmm. with the sun on my face and a hot dog in my hand. I mean, there's literally not a better experience in life, in my opinion. Hey, Aaron, what was the game that you and your brother made up called? I, I, underwater, I BB. underwater BB stacking. Yeah, actually, I think my brother technically made it up, uh, but it's been an ongoing joke. He was the first Olympian uh, who won the gold medal for underwater BB stacking. He stacked exactly two BBs. So, because <laughs> you can't stack more than two right. BBs on top yeah. of each other. I mean, that <laughs> Especially underwater. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, question three, this is a bit different. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? Uh, I, I guess read people's minds. So I got to tell you, that would scare the heck out of me about what people think. Uh, uh, I guess about me as well. But, you know, uh, I, I already have uh, super speed, according to my daughter. I'm much faster than she is. Uh, and strength. So <laughs> once again, I can, I can lift her uh, very easily. So Fair point. It's all relative. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's all, ab good. absolutely all relative. Oh, That's okay. good. Uh, question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? Oh, I, I, this is an easy one. Uh, <clears throat> every time I say this, people are looking at me sideways. Uh, I don't think we have a provider shortage. I think we just misuse the providers we have and make them super unproductive uh, or ineffective at what they do. And if we just found a way to take away the nonsense, uh, we would have plenty of providers to go around. That's a fair point. Yeah. I, the, the AMA would completely disagree with me about that one, but <laughs> I'm not a member of the AMA, so not yeah. my problem. That's good. Uh, last question that we have, this is a pandemic lockdown related question. Uh, what is one hobby or activity you've gotten into since the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, well, you know, as I said, I mean, spend more time with my family. I mean, I think we all did that, but not in necessarily meaningful ways, but probably a specific um, example is uh, right before the pandemic, we were very lucky. Uh, my best friend from high school, she turned, uh, well, I won't say the age she turned uh, in case she listens to this. Uh, More respectful of you. <laughs> yeah, but we, we went to Napa um, right before um, the pandemic, literally like two or three weeks before, four huh. weeks before. And uh, we went to a winery, many wineries, but we went to one winery and uh, they had a chair uh, made out of a, a wine barrel that mm. I fell in love with, uh, me and my wife fell in love with. And so we went and bought these chairs, very expensive. Mm -hmm. No one in their mind would spend this much money, but we did. <laughs> and we got the chairs not too long into the pandemic. And uh, since the pandemic, it was our, you know, release. We, you know, mm -hmm. I'd got to get home, we'd go in the backyard, beautiful outside, be That's sunny. Cool sit in this wine chair, a glass of wine, read a book, or just hang out, listen to music and talk. And it was by, it's been by far the most, um, um, you know, supportive and, and coping thing that I've done, you know, uh, since this whole thing started and probably honestly ever in my life. It really, it's the place I can go where I know I, I'm relaxed and can just enjoy life. That's awesome. I call my wine chairs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. I want to Google what a wine chair is. I've never... Oh, I'll have to send you a picture. Honestly, it's the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. It's like this Adirondack chair that's made out of a mm. wine barrel. And oh. it even comes stained with the wine yeah, at yeah, first, yeah. but then oh. it kind of rubs off. But, you know, really, it's uh, they're amazing. That's neat. That's cool. Yeah, Josh, I might have to get you one. 
That's awesome. It has to be they're, as good as it earns, though. It has to they're be. They're pretty, <laughs> yeah. pretty expensive. I don't know. You know, I don't know if Josh has earned it. Yeah, Josh, you have, you have to pay me a bit more, and then I'll get you one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so great. I can buy my own wine chair. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, maybe. I don't know. Not with these questions you've asked. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Aaron, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You know, you've you've taught us a lot over, you know, how you've been resilient through COVID and, and how you've developed this, you know, culture of innovation and compassion that you share for all of your employees, all your staff, and really the industry at large. And um, again, just really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and, and share everything that you've learned uh, based on our questions, at least. But thanks so much, Aaron. Yeah, thank thanks you. for having me.